Hello everyone and welcome to week two. This is going to be a review on SQL. SQL or Structured Query Language is how we are going to be interacting with our database. SQL can be used to view, organize, and manage data. SQL uses commands or queries. You can do them at the command prompt if that's how you choose to. Sometimes there's also the option to do it at a GUI or graphical user interface. One of the things that's really nice about SQL is it's actually relatively human readable. So for a lot of people, they don't necessarily enjoy programming or coding. And SQL actually gives the ability to be able to make queries without necessarily knowing any programming. And so it tends to be a lot more friendly to a wider group of people. So you'll sometimes see businesses where people may not know any programming or coding or they may not even necessarily be tech people, but they can, will still end up doing some SQL as part of their job. SQL can also have some scripts if you want to automate things or make queries more efficient. SQL and MySQL. So SQL or SQL is the language. MySQL is the actual database. You may hear this as SQL. You may hear this as SQL. Both are considered acceptable. Now, Technically, you may end up finding some people that are super like, it has to be this one. This is the only right one. Um, and that's fine. For those people, it's usually better to just not agree and walk away. Uh, but technically, either SQL or SQL is considered acceptable. Uh, quick note for the meme. Um, Skewl and squeal are not acceptable. Those are jokes. Uh, so the language is how we ask questions of the database. So SQL is how we say like, hey database, uh, what are all of the books that were published in 1980? Hey database, what are all of the movies that are currently rated at four stars or above? So that's what we would use SQL and the queries for. SQL is interactive, and one of the things that makes it really popular is that you can see the results really fast, and it bridges a really nice gap. So it's close enough to programming that a lot of developers can pick it up really quickly. But it's far enough away from programming and close enough to human readable that a lot of people who aren't developers can also pick it up really quickly. It's actually relatively reasonable to learn. Uh, you can learn SQL in a relatively short amount of time. Now, I, I say relatively because it's not like you're going to look at it for 10 minutes and then be like, oh, I now know SQL. You, you're not downloading anything. This isn't the matrix, unfortunately. Um, but it's something where if you take some time, do some practice, refresh your memory, go through some tutorials, try some challenges, it's very reasonable to be able to learn SQL regardless of your programming ability. Once it's set up, a company is unlikely to move away from SQL. And because SQL was very popular early on, a lot of companies will use SQL. Um, and MySQL is their database. SQL is pretty dependable. It's been in use for a really long time, so there's been a lot of testing on it. One of the things that happens in industry is companies really like to have things that have been sort of tried and true. They don't necessarily, uh, for a lot of companies, they don't necessarily like to jump on new things because Sometimes new things are awesome, um, you know, and sometimes companies will do things like, yay, AI, let's save money, and they're willing to jump in it, but th not always, and sometimes companies are like, no, actually, this has the potential to, you know, really sink the ship, as it were, so because SQL has been around for so long, it kind of is really popular. Uh, because it's really human readable, you'll actually also see a lot of different departments using it. It's not just like, oh, only the IT department uses it. Um, marketing will use it. QA will use it. Sales will use it. Some larger companies will actually even have free courses. So anywhere in the company, if you want to learn SQL, they will offer to teach it to you. SQL the brand. So technically, SQL was standardized in the 80s, but there's actually different dialects. So 
technically, SQL Server is proprietary and owned by Microsoft. However, there's a lot of different dialects of SQL. So that basically means it's kind of like SQL, but not. So let's say, for example, um, if we think about English as the language, we could think about British English as a dialect or American English or Australian English as the dialect. Um, if you happen to live near Boston, I, I will say I have a slight Boston accent that I try to hide. So I'm, you know, uh, we kind of have our own dialect and sometimes we'll say things and other people will be like, yeah, I don't think those were words. Um, it's just a different dialect. That's just how that happens. That happens with languages too. That happens with SQL. A basic SQL query. Now, if we're starting with just basic queries, each table in the database will have fields each record will have a row and a column. We have to know what we're looking for so that we can ask the question correctly. We can form our query properly. The SQL queries are going to start and include commands such as select, update, insert, or delete. You need to figure out the question that you're asking first, then translate it into the query. So for example, um, I wanna see everybody who's a customer would be select, splat from customers. Now, um, this might be splat if you come from a Linux environment. You might see star if you're coming from a different environment, but they're both the little sort of um, star splat symbol above the eight on your keyboard. So select splat from customers or select star from customers is show me everything from the customers table. Select is saying what you want the star or splat says, give me it all. From lets us know where we are actually pulling the data. And then the word after that is the name of the table that we're pulling it from. So in this case, it's customers, could it, but it could just as easily be, you know, um, patients or students or classes or whatever the name of the table happens to be. Now, one of the best things that you can do, go try it. Um, I have included several different options for try it in the notes up on my website or uh, in Blackboard if you're in the class. There's some links here that you can go try it. You can try Adventure Island. You could try W3 Schools. Um, there's lots of different options, but just go try a couple queries. See what it looks like. See what changes you can make. See what's required. See what's not required. When we have SQL, we can also manipulate the data in different ways. We can show some pieces, not other pieces. We can organize the data. So for example, we can ask the data to be given to us in a particular pattern. For example, ascending or descending. So we can use the order by and say, I want to see everything from the books table and order by cost descending. So again, this is going to tell us what we are selecting. In this case, the star or splat means give me it all. From the books table, we know that order by, and you can tell the capitalization here is how we can tell that these are special words or keywords. Those are not changeable. Um, the Order by says how we want this data presented to us. And then the cost is going to be the column. So this is the cost of the book. And then I want it ordered by descending. I could have done ascending. But that's how we would be able to request the data given to us in different ways. We can use filters. So if we don't necessarily want all of the data, or maybe we do want all of the data, but we want specific sections of the data. So to get these sections, we can actually filter the data using things like equal to, not equal to, greater than, less than. Now, uh, some of this is going to work. We can have filters or groupings to look for specific pieces of data but the filters of equal or not equal, greater than, less than, um, some of these like greater than, less than, you can really only do with numbers. So you have to make sure that it's actually like, you know, the numbers, you can't say like, I want to know all 
books that are greater than, you know, I don't know, Lord of the Rings. Like, well, what's what's greater than Lord of the Rings? What's less than Lord of the Rings? Now, obviously, I could give you my opinion. What's greater than Lord of the Rings? Not a whole lot. Um, but, but that's not really how databases work. So we want to stick to, in this particular case, this example, the greater than less than is going to be numbers. And so we could look for all books that cost less than $10 or more than $5 or equal to $9.99. Um, you know, or if we would like to update this for prices, you know, as far as I can tell for books, $30, which I'm still a little bitter about. Um, so we can do things like say, you know, hey, database, please only give me parts of the data. So what are all of the books that are $20 or less, all of the books that are $5 or less, all of the books that are between $20 and $30. We can ask those kinds of questions so that we have less data to work with. Um, if we think about it for patient records, please give me all of the patients that were born uh, in the 80s. Please give me all of the patients that were born in the 70s. Please give me all of the patients that are older than 55 because, you know, there are some tests uh, that you only do at specific ages. There are some things that you do in a doctor's office, like maybe you get specific vaccines at a specific age. And so, you know, these types of things are really helpful because then we say, okay, well, tell me everybody who's 13 months old, because we know that's when we need to give a vaccine. Tell me everybody that's 36 months old, because that's when we know we need to give a vaccine. Stuff like that. We can also add in multiple options. So we can add in extras. We can say things like books that cost less than $10 and were published in the last 10 years. So we can say, you know, hey, I want to see everything from the books table where the price is less than $10 and the publication date is greater than 2015. So we can really narrow more in on the type of data that we're seeing. So instead of having, you know, 10,000 records come back to us, maybe we only have 3,000 records come back to us. So we can really narrow in on that. We can also do things like look for unique data or distinct data so that we can start looking at data without duplication. So we could look at unique library patrons or unique books or unique patients, uh, unique doctors, different things like that. So we can look for things without duplication and take an accurate inventory. Sometimes you may end up having um, duplicate data and that duplicate data is actually important to keep but you don't necessarily want it if you're doing an inventory of something. There's actually a whole bunch of different functions and keywords that you'll have in SQL. Some of these will go across dialects some will not. So be careful of the type of SQL that you're using because that will affect what is available and the keywords that are used. So um, in this example, I actually have linked to the Wikibooks for the SQL dialects reference so that you can see some examples. For example, if you wanted to find the natural logarithm of x, natural log x, well, standard SQL says it's ln of x. MS SQL says it's log of x. My SQL says it can be either one and it doesn't care. So it's important that you know which dialect you're using. SQL queries will be processed in a particular order. Now, this may end up mattering because you want to make sure that you are processing everything and you have it in the correct order in your query. But that can also matter when we start talking about efficiency of queries later in term. But it's just going to end up being important to know that SQL queries have an order and this is the order that they run in. Primary keys are unique identifiers. They used to be numeric only but they don't have to be. Do not use data. Sometimes Microsoft will refer to primary keys as ID numbers. The modern trend however 
because we're looking at large amounts of data in very large databases with lots of people looking at them, we'll actually make the primary keys GUIDs or GUIDs or UUIDs instead of numeric. So instead of like, you know, one, two, three, four, stuff like that, it will have a GUID or this UUID. Windows people might say GUID. Unix people might say UUID. They're kind of used interchangeably though, so you could really call it either. And if you asked somebody about GUID, they would probably be able to tell you. But because of the GUID being a selection of numbers and letters and a frankly very long one, it will make sure that multiple systems are able to enter data without using the same key. An incremental key generator can create choke points. So let's say, for example, we had everybody in a classroom trying to add data to a database. Well, if we did incremental keys, then that would be, you know, for example, one, two, three, four, five. So that means the people in the classroom would have to do it in order. And so they would have to make sure that the ID has been generated, used. Next person, generated, used. However, if we end up doing these GUIDs, what can happen is everybody can enter data into the database kind of at the same time without having to worry about if they're going to run over each other because you don't have to worry about the GUIDs being the same. So all of this data can get added to the database simultaneously. It makes it a little bit easier. Foreign keys can also be called functionally dependent keys or abbreviated as FD. It points to the table with the data always points to the primary key. This is how we can describe the relationship between the tables in a relational database. If we know that our relational database is made up of a bunch of tables, the tables will all have a primary key for their data. And if the tables end up having a relationship to each other, then that foreign key will be able to point from the table to another table. Some databases will call them both the ID, but we don't want to do that. That's no good. Primary key ensures unique data has to be unique. The foreign key shows the relationship between the tables. The primary key only has one primary key value allowed. The foreign key can have more. Primary keys may not be null values, but foreign keys can be. Primary keys cannot be deleted, foreign keys can be deleted. So it's basically just a way for us to be able to show the relationship if there is one between the data in these tables. So that's the first review of SQL. I hope you are all having a lovely day.